North Sea oil. As it runs dry, how can we pay the unemployed? National service, why has the government brought it back? Britain's largest manufacturing group. Why is it heading for the Caribbean? Good evening. British Imperial Holdings, Britain's largest manufacturing group, has delivered a sharp rebuff to the government. BIH boss Sir Geoffrey Goodwin told shareholders that the increase in company tax announced in last week's budget would cost the company over five million pounds. He gave notice of the company board's refusal to accept an ever-increasing financial burden. The company plans to move to the Bahamas. But the Secretary of State for Industrial Affairs, Mrs. Martha Browning, told Parliament today that the government had no intention of backing down. Do you like kites? That's my city down there. My world. Welcome to it. Looks its best from up here. There's nothing black and white about it. Just shades of grey. Like the future. Close enough to see the outline. Too far to make out the details. Have you ever wondered what the world would be like if everything the computer experts promised us actually happened? If all the dreams and the prophecies of the gurus came true? Oh, I see the almost total elimination of people in the production process, in mass production processes, and the almost total elimination of people in routine servicing of the products of mass production. What are all the people doing in these buildings during the day? They go up and down in elevators and as you know they shuffle paper and they make telephone calls. Some even run computer systems. But the majority of these people are really engaged in tasks which may be better done by machines. You know, I really do believe that machines can do everything better than people. I'm not claiming that this is the way your future has to be. You know, scientists now claim that every time you make a decision, get up, stay in bed, pizza, hamburger, Indian, Chinese takeaway, you actually choose them all. But each of them gets chosen by a different you, in a different universe, in some other dimension. So no, this isn't the future. It's just one of an infinite number of possible ways things might work out for you. The one where nobody made any decisions and just let technology develop by its own private rules. Your future world depends on the choices you make. Me? <clears throat> I'm stuck with this one.
British Imperial Holdings has the latest in automated production lines, based in South America, Africa and the Far East, manufacturing everything from tableware to tanks. The group is run from this prestige office complex in the city. The 300 million pound London headquarters were only completed 18 months ago. Now the company plans to sell the building off. Sir Geoffrey's letter to shareholders points out that the profits from the company's worldwide activities have always come home to the city of London. But Britain's company tax levels are amongst the highest in the world. Using high-speed communication systems, there is nothing to prevent the company moving its group headquarters to a country with a kinder financial climate. This would be in the interest of British shareholders. Industrial Secretary Mrs Browning said today that the cabinet were not in a position to influence BIH's decision to move out of the country. The government takes a view that is properly a matter for the board of BIH alone. There is now a new order, a global marketplace for ideas, money, goods and services that knows no national boundaries. This is a world where computers and communications link up an ever-changing, ever-shifting mesh of transnational and multinational companies, moving their production and administration to wherever profits are highest and taxes are lowest, where government is generous and labor is docile owing nothing to national allegiance or old-fashioned patriotism. Answerable to nobody except their shareholders, wherever they are. Behind the armed guards and the razor wire, behind the surveillance cameras and the electronic movement detectors, the world's 22nd largest corporation stands in splendid isolation. We may be miles from anywhere here, but this is the axis of Chemo Technologies world. You can't see it, but up there somewhere, there's the first link in a chain of satellites. The beam from this dish is like an invisible spider's thread linked up into space, spreading out into a communications web which wraps up the world. One man sits in the center of it all, like a spider, sensing every tremor and change. Oh, my, this one up. Well, I hardly need to expand that one up to see how bad it is. Look at this appalling business. Look at year to date. So there he sits, running his great world empire from the English home counties. He doesn't need workers. There aren't any workers in his factories, just a few supervisors and maintenance men. And he doesn't need managers. Managers only manage people. And if he ever needs to take advice, well, he's got his computer to do that for him too. And uh, there it is. I've got some real problems here that uh, I'm going to send that one off to somebody. Now I've got three alternatives here. I can send it the page only, or I can send the complete document. I'm going to send in the complete document, and I'm going to send it as updated, and I'm going to send it by electronic mail. And that will send it off by electronic mail. That is now gone. There is no intrinsic difference between a business decision and the decisions which are involved in a production process control system, an area regarded as perfectly legitimate for computerization. Smaller, faster, better, cheaper was always the motto of the microchip. Well, there can be very little doubt that uh, the driving force over the last 30 years of rapid developments in semiconductor technology. And I think as, uh, it will be all pervasive. Every aspect of our life will be affected, whether it's social, political, 
government, on the factory floor, in the office, uh, electronic devices will become a way of life with us. First, computers filled a room. Then they shrank small enough to fit on a desk. Then in a pocket. Then anywhere and everywhere. And they learned to do anything except laugh. It's certainly the case that we intend to mimic human beings. Uh, basically, the goal of our research is to build computers that are just like people. Um, the, the idea that computers would somehow be better than people is something to aim at, but we really have a whole lot of problem just equaling them first. Today we can already see uh, the situation where the engineers can design the product very quickly, simulate its effectiveness, simulate the accuracy of the design, and feed that automatically into machines concerned with the manufacture of product. Uh, the materials, raw materials, have been ordered automatically by the computers. They are automatically checked in, and the product flows through the manufacturing process, almost untouched by hand. And then, at the end of the cycle, automatic dispatching by computer systems, automatic invoicing, all the financial billings, accounts receivable and so on, automatically being taken care of by the mainframe of that particular concern. First the machines were instructed by men and women who taught them all they knew. All the hard, boring things that women and men don't like to do. But they also taught them to play games, to draw and paint and recite poems. When I was a child, I speak as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. Now they control machines, and machines which build other machines. They can see, they can hear and understand. Please state your flight destination. San Francisco. San Francisco. From which airport are you planning to depart? Newark. Newark. They can tap into our thoughts. They clothe us, feed us, and tell us what to do. Turn left at the next intersection. Now drive on two blocks. Careful. Not too fast. No new jobs in the service sector. The service sector will, in the coming years, undergo a jump in productivity comparable to the gains in productivity enjoyed by agriculture and industry. I envisage a 20-mile area at the centre of England eliminating totally uh, Birmingham, Coventry, Warwick and places like this being nothing but one gigantic automated factory with hardly any people. And that way, you know, you get back to England's green pleasant land providing you're 20 miles away from it and can't see it. The Birminghams, the Roars, the Clevelands, Ohio, all the jobs that we had in manufacturing, all those big cities that were built for manufacturing, they just died. Suddenly, British clerical work was done in Hong Kong. It was done in Singapore. American clerical work was done in El Salvador. Suddenly, suddenly, we just didn't need clerical staff. We didn't need admin staff. And artificial intelligence systems started taking the decisions for us. So where we had managers before, we had no managers now. 
A lot of people work part-time, a lot of people work in temporary nature, but very few people now could you call working class in the way we could in the 1970s and the 1960s. When it was just the working class, a lot of people didn't worry, why did we need them? But suddenly, in the mid-90s, when it became very clear that the middle-class children weren't getting jobs, that that network explosion had, had actually done something, that's when people suddenly really stood up and started to take notice. At that point, when the fifth generation equipment came in and reduced the chances of managerial jobs and professional jobs for the sons and daughters of managers and professionals who thought they would follow in their footsteps, at that point, all hell broke loose. There were riots all over Europe. It was the equivalent of the year of revolutions, except it was the year of riots. North Sea oil extractors today announced that they're shutting down the last working well in the Brent oil field. At its peak, the Hillary well was producing 500,000 barrels of oil a day and contributing half a million pounds to the treasury. Now the company says it is no longer worth the cost of maintenance. Whitehall has made no comment so far, but sources close to the Prime Minister suggest that he is concerned about the effect of the loss of revenue on Britain's social services programme. A reduction in the scope of the National Social Service could see a return to the riots and disorders of a few years ago. About 2005, 2006, the government, not only in Britain, but in most continental countries too, within the EEC, or what was the old EEC, uh, in, at that point, the governments all decided what we needed was a good compulsory community service. And we had compulsory community service. The traditional work ethic will be declared irrelevant or counterproductive to society's needs. Compulsory leisure activities may be imposed on those for whom there is no place in the labour force. This is the National Social Service. You see them around, groups of kids doing the jobs everybody wants done but nobody seems to want to pay for. Digging roads, putting up public buildings, hospitals, schools. I feel pretty sick. Sort of getting cold, wet, muddy. I can't stand it. Because I would sort of like to have done social work, but getting training for it would be virtually impossible. I think because funding's gone down for it, as with everything else where you need to be trained. So it's sort of a bit bleak. Why should we have to like get someone to say, well, you've got to do this and you've got to do that? They wouldn't like it. So why should we have to part with it? Digging roads. What life is that for a youngster like me? You get used to it after a while anyway. But it's just the point, like, you get depressed. Everyone wants to do something. I mean, I want to be a doctor. There's nothing. There's nothing. No future. No plans. No jobs. I mean, even 20 years ago, you know, computer operator, something like that. But even they've taken over by computers now. The priorities ought to be people, putting people first, and giving people work, and giving them something they want to do. Something that fulfill them. I want to be a teacher. This is not what I want to do. I think it's wrong that I should have to do this. This job should be better paid and then people maybe would want to do it and we wouldn't have to. Back at the start of computing, Norbert Wiener, the mathematician, said very simply this. It seemed to him that in an era of automated machines, the average man of mediocre attainments had little to offer which it was worth anyone's money to buy. If you were looking for the true spirit of my world, you might well find it here. In a new age of slavery, now that machines serve people, people don't serve anymore. A long time ago, 
One of the founding fathers of the computer age wrote a warning to the trade unions who represented workers in the old days. What he wrote went something like this. Anybody who competes with slave labor, doesn't matter if the slaves are human or mechanical, must accept the working conditions of slaves. And who'd be prepared to do that? Besides, as they say, machines don't let you down the way people do. So if you need your walls painted, your plumbing fixed, your electricity wired in, unless you're very rich, you're on your own. DIY rules. This is a temple to the new equality, one of the places where we all end up in the end, trying to patch up our homes and our lives. Hey, Bob. Hello, Steve. What are you up to? Oh, you know, this and that. But, uh... Oh, no, these days. Got to keep the wolf from the door. I thought you had a job. Yeah, I did. DNA sequence of uh, Genetics International. And? Ah, uh, you know the way it goes. One morning they brought in a new machine that had been taught its tricks by some American Nobel Prizer. <laughs> so they could use kids straight out of school do what I've been doing up to then. I wasn't about to be treated like no kid. Just gave me two fingers. You know, I like what I'm doing now. Which is? Plastic. Plastic? Oh, plastic, you know. Plastic money, credit cards, bank cards, smart cards, decoding, reprogramming, bumping up credit ratings, wiping out overdrafts, that sort of thing. A bit risky, isn't it? <laughs> Thousands of us doing it. It's a big industry. No, it's hardly legal, though, is it? Look, Bob, there aren't that many ways left for people like me to use their imagination. It's creative. You not expect anything less than me, would you? Oh, fancy your coffee? Yeah, why not? Ah, to be daft, let me. Coffee, milk, two sugars. Coffee, milk, two sugars. Thank you, madam. Have a nice day. Any three for a pan and a stand, girls or boys or one of each. Some people will always find a way of making a living. But in my world, it's every man and every woman for themselves. The only person who goes begging here is the tax man. On the one hand, the formal economy has gone down, and on the other hand, the black economy has come up. We have a black money system. Real money, you put it in your pocket. But there are millions of people in Britain who depend on that. Whereas, round about the 1980s, 1990s, something like 12-15% of gross domestic products of countries were spent on something to do with unemployment, we've suddenly reached the point now where it's 56%. And when that happens, you really need to keep the money coming in. British Imperial Holdings has still not announced whether it intends to carry out its threat to leave Britain. Professor John Saunders, advisor to the BIH board, had a three-hour meeting with the chairman this afternoon. Could he throw any light on the situation? Forced to remain in this country with an ever-increasing tax burden, British industrial holdings will quickly cease to be competitive. And that's in nobody's interest, least of all Britain's. But Industry Secretary Martha Browning said that British companies shouldn't forget what they owe to Britain. The facts of the matter are that in this country, wealth-producing enterprises must accept they are a major source of tax revenue and that they have responsibilities in return for the undoubted benefits they derive from their location in Britain. Running a company is about making money. You need the money for reinvestment in the most modern equipment, the most up-to-date technologies that you can have. If you're not going to do it, and you, you don't believe that's the right thing, your competitors will certainly do it, and you'll be blown out of the water at some point of time or other. Therefore, it's your responsibility to actually minimize the amount of tax you're paying. You cannot just allow companies like BIH to just swan off overseas. If you do that, there is no one left to tax. At that point, you have to say to yourself, look, there is a national interest, and the national interest and responsibility demands that BIH remains a British company, that its production facilities remain British, that what jobs it can create remain British, and its revenues are and profits are British.
Back in 1930, an economist called Keynes wrote that technology would finally solve mankind's 10,000-year-old economic problem. But that's a problem in itself. It's only worth making things in a market economy if people can buy them and have the money to buy them. Now, one of the problems created by the future, which we've just seen, is that as production becomes concentrated, as modern high technology allows all the goods that we need to be, be produced by fewer and fewer people, then fewer and fewer people will have the money to buy the goods that are produced because fewer people will be employed in those high-paying, high-tech jobs, whilst a large number of people seem to be uh, unemployed or employed only in menial, low-paying jobs. So society will face a crisis because although we could produce the goods, there won't be the demand forthcoming to sustain that production. So the problem that we'll face and the problem that uh, we have to face up to in a modern high-tech future is how, to, how do we do redistribute income in society so that demand is sustained to maintain the prosperity of everybody. Today, BIH subsidiary offices in London have called in the removal men. Nobody is saying when they start on the group headquarters. If British Imperial holdings really do carry out their threat to move to the Bahamas, the only thing British about our biggest company will be the name. As I told you at the beginning, I'm not claiming that my world is your future. But it's a possibility. In any case, it's not such a bad place. So, I haven't got a moral for you. Well, Next time I hear a claim that somebody's just invented some fantastic new machine that can do a lot more things that only people used to, I won't ask how. I'll ask why. <laughs>